Welcome back to AP World History Modern Test Prep for Unit 6. This unit is all about the consequences of industrialization. Just take a second to think about how that's worded. Consequences of industrialization. There's definitely a negative connotation for that word of consequences. So just kind of like how my son's plastic baseball bat sometimes gets taken away because he hits the TV, I tell him it's a consequence for his action. It communicates a negative reaction. And then I explain to him how, you know, hitting our flat screen is not a good idea and it would really also be bad for him because he would no longer get to watch Paw Patrol or Blippi. So what are the consequences of industrialization? Or what are the negative effects of it? Last unit, we focused on how cities became overcrowded. People lived in tenements, there was more pollution, there was poverty, increased crime, and a growing gap between the rich and the poor. But the reality is, is it didn't just impact the cities where factories were being built, but impacted the entire world. Now, my hope is that you can connect the dots between how the Industrial Revolution led to imperialism. It is the big idea that really frames this entire unit. Industrialization caused many countries to need more natural resources for the industrial process, food for their growing populations, and then markets to sell those finished goods they made in the factories. So let's jump into unit six. Imperialism is the act of extending rule or authority over a foreign country that's not your own. While this sometimes could be through direct political rule and the creating of a settler colony, it is often more indirect rule or just really having influence over, kind of like a puppet master who's pulling the strings behind the scene or like the man behind the curtain. Other times, imperialism was through economic dominance and sometimes just blatant stealing of resources. We're gonna see a lot of that as well. I would argue there are five major or main rationales or reasons for imperialism. Number one, by far, is money. And I will talk about how Europeans wanted raw resources like rubber and cotton and palm oil and so many other things, but no one is really excited about having cotton or rubber. Yay. Really, it's because they can make huge profits from these raw materials when they're turned into finished goods. Cotton turns into clothing, and rubber turns into tires that they could put on Model Ts or bicycles. Then they can sell these goods to foreign markets. Remember how Matthew Perry forced open the Japanese ports? Well, it's all about the money. Number two, white man's burden. Based off of a poem by Rudyard Kipling, white man's burden is the idea that there's a burden or a duty to help Europeans help civilize the savage or the primitive people that are incapable of self-government. And they, with some maybe European guidance, they could eventually be civilized. It's even painful to say. The whole concept is terrible, infuriating, rude, and racist. And unfortunately, some of these racist beliefs still exist today, and they just look different in our modern context. Now, this one builds on white man's burden. Number three is nationalism. Nationalism led people to believe that their people group and culture was better than other nations, so they could disregard those other nations' sovereignty or the right to rule themselves and their lands. Now, the word nationalism is super tricky because of how we use the phrases nation, state, and country kind of all interchangeably today. The United States, Canada, South Africa are all examples of countries that you could find on a map. And confusing to those who live in the United States, we think of states as things like Wisconsin or Texas or California as states. But a state is really just a synonym for a country. But a nation is different. It refers to a people group who share a common culture, language, and as well as oftentimes a religion, and they live in a same geographic region. Often states and nations, they won't match each other. British people live in Britain, but not all people who live in Britain speak English and like fish and chips and belong to the Church of England. In fact, there are people who are British that don't even live in Great Britain, but live in Canada or the US. 
I think within our context, it might be helpful to think of Native American groups as nations, like the Navajo Nation or the Iroquois, or more close to where we live, the Ho-Chunk Nation, which is a Native American people group who share a common culture and language and beliefs. Again, not all nations, though, are countries that you would find on a map. Now, the idea of national communities and creating independent states based on shared identities arises during this period when we talked about in last unit five, talking about revolutions and how these occurred because people felt a national identity and how they were different from the people that ruled them. But we're also going to see a very dark side of nationalism. Nationalism breeds racism and the belief that one group is superior to another group. It breeds fear of the other. And when we mix nationalism with the idea of white man's burden, it's kind of infused this false duty and rationale that Europeans, what they did in Africa and Asia, it was totally acceptable. Not only were they superior in looking at the interests of their home state, but it was acceptable because those people were uncivilized and it was Europeans' burden to help them become more like them. <sighs> it's terrible. And if it weren't bad enough, let's go for rationale number four, which is social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is a social theory based on the laws of evolution of Charles Darwin and applying those scientific principles to society. Social Darwinists argued that the fittest or the best individuals or entire countries would prevail. The fact that Europeans could take over African states because of their advanced technology due to the Industrial Revolution proved that they were indeed superior. Also frustrating. Where is that SAQ that asks for evidence to refute a claim by the author of a passage? Because this would be my opportunity to discuss how so much of European advancements were actually based on previous advanced civilizations like the Chinese or the learning that came from Dar al-Islam. And Britain itself just got lucky with their natural resources that were in their area, which is why they industrialized in the first place. Or the fact that you can't take a scientific theory and just apply it to social situations. It's pseudoscience. It's where you cherry pick different ideas just to fit your own ideology. <sighs> Number five, a desire to spread Christianity. As many European nations were Christian, this is a continuity that influences imperialistic desires. Just like the Spanish in the Americas, there were those that used Christianity as a tool to justify their behavior, where they could just kill natives because they were heathens. But there are also those that truly were trying to share their beliefs and serve native populations, offer education. I think of Bartholomew de las Casas, who spoke out against the injustices, against the indigenous people in the Americas, and in the same way, there will be missionaries that stand up against mistreatment of people in Africa and Asia. And as well, I think specifically in the Congo, where missionaries chronicled and told of the terrible exploitation of the Congolese. So number one, money, money, money. I think that's the big one. Number two, white man's burden. Three, nationalism. Four, social Darwinism. Five, spreading of Christianity. The tricky part is how these ideologies overlapped each other and they supported each other. And it became kind of tricky to untangle the true rationales. I'm gonna go back with money. Throughout the entire course, we've been talking about how states were created, expanded, and then maintained their power. So which states were expanding in the years of 1700 to 1900? If we go back to our big five from the previous time period of 1450 to 1750, Portugal, Spain, Britain, France, and the Netherlands were our big five maritime empires prior to industrialization. In the Sausagerakis at Miller Park, Portugal started out first, but then was surpassed by Spain, who had a very large lean for a long time. But now by far, the person that came from the back was Great Britain, and they are leading in state expansion in this period. They have this famous phrase that the sun never set on the British Empire, reiterating that they had so many colonies that the sun literally was shining somewhere, even if it was nighttime in Great Britain. On the most basic level, most industrialized nations were being imperialistic. This included new people to the race, like the United States and Russia and Japan as well. Check out this map. Now the British kicked off the Industrial Revolution. Notice all the pink 
where Great Britain has control, significant holdings in Africa, India, Canada, and even a prison colony in Australia and a settler colony in New Zealand. France too, as they expanded into West Africa, as you can see a large green area, and even established a settler colony in Algeria where many French, Italian, and Spanish immigrants moved to. France also established French Indochina in modern day Vietnam and Laos. Russia expanded all the way to the Pacific, as you see on there, which made a huge empire. The United States expands with the idea of manifest destiny to the Pacific Ocean. They gain Alaska from Russia and even overthrow the monarchy in Hawaii. Even Germany, who unified in 1871 and industrialized, established their own colonies in Africa. Japan did the same as they expanded into Korea and fought the Russians, and in the following time period, we'll see them even go into China. Many industrialized nations were in the imperialism race, but how did we get here, and what made the map look like that? If there was one event that you needed to be aware of about imperialism in this period, it needs to be the Berlin Conference of 1885. And it is at the very end of this period, if you think about it. I mean, look at this map. This is Africa in 1879. You see that the effects of Europeans just using Africa for trading posts, the former Atlantic slave trade, and stops on their way to the Indian Ocean. This totally changes after the Berlin Conference. German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck arranged a conference to settle how European countries would claim colonial lands in Africa so that they could avoid a war amongst European nations over these lands. Without a single African leader present at the meeting, they negotiated who would have which lands. And suddenly, by 1889, the map looked like this. Now, many European states used their advanced weaponry against the indigenous people who simply could not defend themselves against a Maxim machine gun. Other states used diplomacy or offered them protectorate status where Europeans would protect them from their neighboring people. All these were methods to expand their empire in Africa with the goal of gaining resources and as we said, ultimately money. But let's not think that Africans just handed over the keys to the Europeans. The same is true all over the world in how indigenous groups responded to imperialism. In Hawaii, in India, in African nations, Southeast Asia, there were a variety of responses that would seem super logical if just an outside force came and tried to take your homeland. Indigenous people negotiated with the Europeans and tried to be diplomatic, meaning they tried to reason and talk it out without turning to fighting. Unfortunately, the European motives that we talked about at the beginning were not quite as genuine and they didn't follow through on all the promises they made. In fact, they often had these like fill in the blank treaties that African leaders often signed without even realizing what the Europeans were doing. And then they had legal contracts for their land. Indigenous people groups tried to be peaceful at the very least. For example, check out this source. The suggestion that the Ashanti in its present state should come and enjoy the protection of Her Majesty, the Queen of England, and the Empress of India is a matter of very serious consideration. I am pleased to announce that we have arrived at the conclusion that my kingdom of Ashanti will never commit itself to any such policy. Ashanti must remain as of old and at the same time remain friendly with all white men. Unfortunately, that didn't always work. So they fought for their lands to defend them and resisted actively the Europeans. Too often when you learn about Africa and Asia, you only learn about it from a Eurocentric lens. These names are just as important for you to know for their valiant attempts to defend their homeland. The most successful nation by far would be Ethiopia, who is able to defend their land against the Italians. The famous Battle of Attawa shows this epic fight where the Ethiopians outnumbered the Italians. They too had machine guns, which leveled the playing field for sure. This is going to be one of those few bright spots where Africans were able to be successful in defending their homeland. In South Africa, the Zulu Kingdom was a established and well-organized state. However, the British presented an ultimatum to the Zulu king, which involved disbanding his army and abandoning key cultural traditions. 
No independent nation would oblige such a request, and so it led to fighting, known as the Anglo-Zulu War. Unfortunately, the British won the war, and the region came under their dominion. If you remember from a previous unit, the Ashanti Kingdom, what will become modern-day Ghana, arose in the late 1600s, and it was incredibly wealthy because of its trade in gold. It had a loose confederation that united neighboring tribes, and they had a pretty advanced army. And as a monarchy, the Golden Stool was the throne for their leader. When Premip I was the leader, he politely declined that invitation of protectorate status nearly 10 years earlier. He was later then exiled by the British, and now the British had the audacity to want the actual physical stool, the throne. Ya Asanta Wa was a queen mother in the Ashanti kingdom and was outraged by this insensitive and culturally unaware request. By far, this is my favorite primary source we read all year in AP World. Check this out. Now I have seen that some of you fear to go forward and fight for our king. If it were in the brave days of old, chiefs would not sit down to see their king taken away without firing a shot. No white man could have dared to speak to the chiefs of the Ashanti in the way the British governor spoke to you chiefs this morning. Is it true that the bravery of the Ashanti is no more? I cannot believe it. Yeah, it cannot be. I must say this. If you, the men of Ashanti, will not go forward, then we will. We, the women, will. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight the white men. We will fight until the last of us falls on the battlefield. And it's so epic. And this is what happened. Ya Asantawa led a rebellion known as the Ya Asantawa War against the British, which all unfortunately ended in the British still winning, but she was exiled then and the Ashanti kingdom became part of the Gold Coast colony. That primary source is awesome and totally kind of brings me back to a little Black Panther-esque moments. So I just think it's awesome. And Ya Asantawa should be a name that you should know for sure, just because it's an epic story. Outside of Africa and India, the British East India Company was a non-state entity that had incredible influence in the region. They initially worked very closely with Indian princes and even hired Indians to work for the British, kind of as like security guards. Most of the soldiers or sepoys that worked for the British were Hindu or Muslim. When they learned that the British were using cartridges that they had greased with a mixture of either cow or pig fat, they became furious as they believed that the British were trying to convert them to Christianity. It led to the Sepoy Revolt or the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Eventually, the British ended the rebellion and killed thousands of Indians. After this, the British exiled the Mughal ruler for his involvement in the rebellion, and India shifted into a official colony of the British. Often the fighting was also inspired by their own religious ideals for protection. The Khosa people in South Africa often resisted British imperialism. They were in the region that was just east of the Cape Colony. Not only did they fight back, but they also turned to their religious beliefs for assistance. The cattle killing movement was started when a Hosa prophetess claimed that if they killed all their cattle and destroyed all their corn, their ancestors would return to drive out European settlers. Unfortunately, they lost to the British. And then because of the cattle killing movement, they suffered from mass starvation. Similarly, in the United States, the Paiute Native American tribe turned to religious beliefs as a way to defend themselves as well from Americans going west. A shaman announced that their dead ancestors would return to defend them and drive out the white man. They performed the ghost dance ritual to ensure that this would happen soon. The ghost dance even then spread to the Sioux tribe and coincided with a lot of their revolts as well. You probably don't need to know all of those examples of the resistance, and these are just some of them. Not even all. There are so many more examples, like the Sokoto Caliphate, or Samar Therese War, or the Maori Wars in New Zealand, and the Philippine Revolution, and the Aboriginal people in Australia, and Tupac Amur II, and more and more and more. The reason why I talked about this at length is because I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss the idea of outside evidence in a DBQ. When you read a DBQ, typically some of the documents will seem similar. 
For example, my students wrote a DBQ about the scramble for Africa, and then they analyzed how Africans responded to imperialism. Some of the documents talk about fighting, others talk about diplomacy, and some even discuss how they were forced to surrender. If those were my major arguments in my DBQ, outside evidence would then be like adding another document, another, uh, like we talked about in the past, another note card with an example to support your argument that isn't found anywhere in the documents provided. In the Scramble for Africa DBQ, there's no mention of the Kosa cattle killing movement or the Anglo-Zulu war. Your job is to gain that point on the rubric is simply to describe those events and show how they are another example that supports the argument that you've created in your essay. If your claim was that many Africans responded by fighting, you would simply add another sentence or two that described Africans fighting like in the Anglo-Zulu War, where the Zulu nation was given an ultimatum by the British to get rid of their army. They refused and fought against the British. Like I said, probably one to two solid sentences that show how your example supports your claim that isn't found anywhere in the DBQ documents. Now, before we transition to the next topic, important public service announcement from me. If you need something to do to relax, I would suggest grabbing some popcorn, snuggling on your couch, and watching Black Panther, especially after watching this video. Even if you've seen it a million times before, I will tell you, you will probably have missed all the amazing parallels to what we have been learning. You will find so many. Pay attention to Killmonger in the British Museum. Watch how Claw describes Wakandans as savages and how the UN calls Wakanda a nation of farmers or a third world country. Or even how a similar line about the sun never would set on the Wakandan empire. You will see rationales for imperialism come to life, and it's so good. Okay, PSA over. We'll get back to the reviewing, but let me know in the comments later what you think and how it pertains to this review video. Now, there's another type of imperialism that we mentioned earlier, and that's economic imperialism. The best example of this is how European nations carved out spheres of influence in China. The Qing dynasty was ruling at the time and was attempting to be isolated from outside influences. In fact, they didn't really desire goods, despite Europeans wanting to sell their finished goods in the Chinese markets. So what did the British do? They became drug dealers. And I'm not even kidding. Remember how the British had been involved economically with the British East India Company in India? And after the Sepoy Rebellion, India changed to a British colony? Well, in India, they had poppies, which is in, makes an opioid. The British started selling opium illegally to the Chinese, and they were pretty successful. The Qing confiscated and destroyed more than 20,000 chests of opium, which clearly upset the British because that was a significant amount of profit that was destroyed. With their advanced weapons, they were able to push up the river and overtake the Chinese city. The series of battles from this event was known as the Opium Wars, and it resulted in the Treaty of Nanjing, an unequal treaty that the Chinese were forced to sign. The Qing were required to pay Britain a lot of money because, you know, those lost goods or drugs, cede Hong Kong to the British and increase the number of treaty ports where the British could now trade and reside from, you know, one to five now. It also gave British citizens extraterritoriality, which exempted them from following Chinese laws. Like I said, an unequal treaty. All of these events led people to dislike the inability of the Qing to lead China well, which led to the Taiping Rebellion. The British then stepped in to support the Qing. An anti-imperialist group arose later that was known as the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists, or the Boxers, because of their martial arts skills. They began to attack Westerners and Christians and missionaries, basically outside influences in China. They were not very successful, but yet again, you can see resistance from indigenous people to these outside influences. Now let's take a sidestep and understand how the Industrial Revolution allowed industrialized nations like Britain and France, Russia, Germany, US, and Japan to become so successful at imperialism. You have to remember how revolutionized transportation and communication. 
All year, we've talked about how empires start, expand, and then maintain their rule. And quite frankly, it's hard to maintain your rule when you are mailing letters across the ocean and communicating with a mother country. But the Industrial Revolution happened. Railroads allowed for people to be transported at much higher speeds and essentially connected empires. In the past, it would be disjointed waterways and few roads were that's all that was really established. But railroads lowered the cost of transporting raw materials and also transporting finished goods. They were built all over industrialized nations. Think of the Trans-Siberian Railroad in Russia or the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States. Japan constructed more railroads during the Meiji reforms after the humiliating treaty with the United States and Matthew Perry. Railroads also spread to colonies. In India, they established a complex rail system that went from the coast to the interior. Another side note, watch the movie Lion starring Dev Patel to see how extensive the rail system is in India, and it's a fantastic film. Anyways, Cecil Rhodes also wanted to build a railroad across Africa from the Cape Town area to Cairo up in Egypt to connect the British colonies in Africa, but it was never completed. Another invention that was really a game changer for resource extraction in colonies was the steamship. Steamships could now travel up and down rivers. With the invention of refrigeration, perishable foods could even cross the oceans. The telegraph allowed people to communicate at much faster speeds. I mean, instantaneously. It started in Britain and within five years, it was already in India as well. My brain really struggles exactly how it works, but the telegraph lines typically followed railroads and later it was on ocean floors. It worked by transmitting electrical signals over those wires um, to different stations, which used Morse code, which is a series of dots and dashes for each letter of the English alphabet. I mean, I remember learning as a kid, SOS. Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Uh, I don't know if that's dating me or if Everyone knows that, but I'm going to hope that you already knew that. Eventually, the telephone would speed up this communication even faster, where you could just directly talk to someone on the phone, which still kind of messes with my mind how that even works still today. Now, we've done a lot of talking about imperialism and the theory of how countries needed raw materials for factories, and it increases food supplies because they have bigger populations in these different urban centers, which will then grow export economies, and again, the extraction of natural resources. You need to know a few of these products and where they originated for this course so that you can use them in writing any essay writing on the test. So number one, cotton. Initially, Britain attained cotton from the American colonies, but then it shifted to India and other places after the American Revolution. Cotton was then used to make textiles. Rubber, as we talked about before. It was found native in the Amazon in South America, but they were also found in Central Africa, especially in the region that we now know as the Congo. When King Leopold II gained the Congo Free State as his personal colony, uh, which is alarming because it's 75 times larger than Belgium itself, initially it was unsuccessful and a financial drain until they realized there was a massive amount of rubber trees and vines throughout the Congo, with the rise of bicycles and automobiles, hoses and, you know, rubber soles on your shoes, King Leopold made a fortune off of rubber found in the Congo. Plus, he by far should be remembered as one of the biggest mass murderers in history. The Congolese people were given quotas of rubber to bring back, and if they were unsuccessful in this labor-intensive work, they would often cut off the hands of Congolese, torture them, rape their family members. It is dark, and it would definitely rival Hitler's cruelty during World War II. All in the name of rubber and money. Palm oil was also used in European factories as a lubricant, and was also found in West Africa. Ivory is obviously from elephants and is found in Africa, and silver in Latin America were both desired goods that were continuities from previous units that we've talked about. Guano or bird feces are really nitrogen rich and helps crops grow. While tricky to harvest bird poop, I distinctly remember a snorkel trip we went on outside of Puerto Vallarta. While we were there, we drove past these small little islands with rocks that were kind of jetted out from the ocean. And you know what lived there? Lots of birds. And those snow-capped, very stinky rock islands, 
full of guano. Now, this is especially also true in Chile and Peru. People could somehow remove those layers of poo and voila, you have a desired good, which would be a very beep job, if you get what I'm saying. Additionally, there's going to be a diamond rush in South Africa, and Cecil Rhodes will develop the De Beers Mining Company, where he had 90% of the world's diamond production. Rhodes eventually becomes the prime minister, and unfortunately, his terribly racist policies and exploitation of Africans will pave the way for apartheid in the future. The final topic of Unit 6 that we need to explore is migration. It is yet another consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Migration was influenced by the changes in demographics, both in industrialized nations and non-industrialized nations, and it presented significant challenges to the existing patterns of living. Because of the nature of the new modes of transportation that we previously discussed, both internal and external migrants increasingly relocated to cities. This pattern contributed to the significant global urbanization of the 19th century. But with the new transportation methods like the railroad and steamships, it also allowed for migrants to return home periodically or permanently. Many people migrated because of labor systems or opportunities for work. With the elimination of slavery in the Atlantic colonies as a result of Enlightenment ideals during this period, with the major exception of slavery that still exists in Africa, there was still a need for low-wage laborers as countries attempted to gain those raw resources. Additionally, with the increase in population, more food was needed as well. European states recruited laborers to work on plantations that formerly were worked on by enslaved people. People from India migrated to British colonies in the Caribbean, South Africa, East Africa, and even to Fiji. Chinese laborers migrated to the United States to build the Transcontinental Railroad. Japanese laborers migrated to Hawaii, Peru, and Cuba to work on sugar plantations. Another type of labor system was indentured servitude. People worked for a set number of years as indentured servants and then would be free after that. This marks a major change within this era as traditional slavery ended and indentured servitude rose. Sometimes people would work for a period of time to earn money for their family and then return home. Oftentimes people stayed in their new host countries. This resulted in a diffusion of culture and altered demographics of regions significantly. Many Asian workers from China or India were forced or tricked into contracts as laborers. Over 125,000 Chinese people went to Cuba alone to work on sugar plantations. In many ways, it was seen as this new type of slavery, and eventually both Britain and the United States stopped the practice. Many people migrated from their home country to another country because of poverty or political unrest or even just famine. They were in search of a better life someplace else. The word to describe these mass immigrations is a diaspora. We will see this with 1.5 million Indians who left the subcontinent as indentured laborers to work on sugar plantations, or the Chinese diaspora, where people left China due to poverty, starvation, and the unrest of things like the Taiping Rebellion. Many Chinese migrated to Southeast Asia, but also to the United States where the gold rush was occurring and, as we said before, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The Irish diaspora was caused by the political tensions in Ireland because they became a part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. As Roman Catholics, there was basically a lot of persecution and they faced religious discrimination. Add in a potato famine and many Irish came to the United States. So what were the effects of all of these migrations? Most clearly was the impact on families in the home countries where they came from. Since males largely traveled as indentured servants or contract laborers, women's roles changed. Often either a male relative would support the women and children who didn't emigrate with their father. Some women began to work outside the home and had more freedoms. Most migrants sent remittances or part of their earnings back home. Also, ethnic enclaves were formed in countries that immigrants migrated to. These are neighborhoods of people from the same foreign country that you would find in many major cities today. For example, the Chinese immigrants that came to the United States and settled in California during the gold rush. 
Many worked in mines or on the railroad, but over time found work in San Francisco in the textile industry. If you were to travel to San Francisco, you could find Chinatown, which was birthed because immigrants living in similar regions came together in the city and they left a cultural mark behind. The same is true with Irish enclaves in the United States. Many Irish came to help construct canal systems or work as farmers. There was a strong anti-Irish and anti-Catholic sentiment alive in the United States at the time, which is kind of hard to understand because of the St. Patrick Day celebrations we know today. But they were responsible for fighting against discriminatory practices in factories and supporting labor unions. They also were influential in spreading Catholicism within the United States. You may not have even realized that the Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys have Irish roots and went on to become incredibly wealthy and influential in the United States. Now, my dream is to visit South Africa, and it is on my bucket list for 2025 to travel with students. But South Africa has a large population of Hindus and Muslims from India, and you may not have known that. They brought with them cultural beliefs and religious beliefs, and many people even had altars in their home to honor Indian deities. Gandhi actually worked in South Africa in 1893 as a lawyer, and he experienced repeated discrimination as they forced him to remove his turban and court and kicked him out of the first class train cabin, despite him having a paid ticket. Many don't realize he formed the Natal Indian Congress, where he worked to dismantle racism and discrimination in South Africa prior to returning to India to lead the nationalist fight against the British rule in India. Now, the biggest consequence of all this migration by far was prejudice, as we've already alluded to. Laws were passed in the United States which blatantly discriminated against the Chinese. In many places, Chinese couldn't have government jobs. They couldn't become citizens of the United States as they were seen as dangerous. Cities were encouraged to remove residents or segregate them to certain neighborhoods. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 banned Chinese immigrants altogether, and it lasted until 1943. Australia mirrored this in many ways, as many Chinese lived in Australia as indentured servants or convicts or merchants. The population surpassed 50,000, so Queen Victoria passed the Chinese Immigration Act of 1855 to limit the number of Chinese in Australia. Even more horrific was the white Australian policy, which started in 1901 and lasted until the 1970s, with the goal to preserve a white Australia. So as we've said in the last video, 1715 to 1900 was indeed revolutionary for political structures and production changed significantly, while continuities of gender equality, racism, and exploitation of lower classes continued. After this video, you'll see this is true in the entire world. We will see that African kingdoms subjected to European imperialism, sovereign nations like China being forced into unequal treaties, and mass production pulling all of those nations in the world together as either providers of resources or as laborers. Gender inequity, racism, and exploitation clearly continue with the ideologies of the white man's burden, social Darwinism, and the civilizing mission. In the name of nationalism, anyone different or considered other or was discriminated against across industrialized nations. And those, my friends, are the sad and long-term tragic effects and consequences of the Industrial Revolution. Thanks for joining me for Unit 6. Be sure to check out the link for the Quizlet deck in the description below to help you study for some of the concepts that didn't make the review video. I hope you check out all the test prep videos in this playlist. Subscribe and hit the bell to stay tuned for more future videos. Thanks for watching and good luck on your AP exam.